<laughs> okay, so time to get back to dynamic programming. So I have an example today that I want to cover. Is it an example or is it a theory example? No, no, it's an example. <laughs> like a real example. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's a linear quadratic problem. <coughs> so the problem is as follows. There is a material with initial temperature x0, and then it goes through a furnace uh, with temperature u0, then its temperature is x1, then it goes through another furnace where the temperature is u1, and then it has a final temperature x2. So this is my furnace 1, this is my furnace 2, and the temperature evolution is x1 equals to 1 minus a x0 plus u0, x2 equals to 1 minus a x1 plus a u1. Okay, so a gets multiplied to u0 as well as a gets multiplied to u1. And my running cost is g0, x0, u0 equals to u0 square, g1, x1, u1 equals to u1 square. And the terminal cost G3, G2 of X2 A is, everything is scalar. So this A is a constant yeah. and it's a scalar. We can't change, okay. Yeah. <coughs> I need to add. Is this a constant between zero and one? Is there a? A. Is a, a is a constant between, uh, A is a constant about the material and the environment. Okay. So now the question is we want to, so if you want to apply dynamic, so we could of course solve it using two different ways. One is using, um, one is using Hamiltonian approach uh, using maximum principle and we get an open loop strategy. Uh, the other one is to use dynamic programming and get a closed loop strategy. So which one should I apply first? Hamiltonian principle? Did you say the first place, uh, the first one was maximum principle? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, the, the open yeah, like the open loop control design, yeah. <clears throat> it has different names in the literature, maximum principle, minimum principle, and so on. Uh, depending upon whether you are minimizing a cost or maximizing a uh, uh, reward function. Okay, so let's let's apply maximum principle on this problem. So optimal open loop controller. So first of all, uh, the expressions were P, PT, uh, which in this case would be P2, is my gradient of G2, which is 2R X2 minus TF.
Okay, so my h of 1 is P2 transpose F1 plus G1, which is Two R X two minus T F multiplied by one minus A X one plus A U one <coughs> plus U one square. Okay, so x2 here also depends on u1. So I need to substitute the value of x2 from here. And what I get is 2r 1 minus ax1 plus au1 minus tf 1 minus ax1 plus au1 plus u1 square. Okay, this is a quadratic function of u1. Now, why is there no need to uh, go all the way back to x0 in this case? So in this, okay, so that's because we will take the derivative with respect to u1 we want to minimize the Hamiltonian with respect to u1. And in order to do that, all we need to know is what all variables depend on u1. So x2 depends on u1, u1 of course depends on u1, and this u1 depends on u1. Uh, x1 is independent of u1. It's dependent on u0, but otherwise it's independent of u1. So we don't have to go all the way to x0. So we don't necessarily need in every case to try to find what the general h of t is because in, I guess in some cases there's not a way to do that or it would be intractable. So it's sufficient to take this iterative approach. So in this, uh, so remember that in the case of uh, open loop control, you need to have a val So if you want to do gradient descent, so we are not doing gradient descent here. If you want to do gradient descent, then you have to come up with some initial u0 and u1, and then you have to compute x1 and x2, and then you have to go through this backward iteration process, right? But in this particular situation, uh, we can go directly backward. We don't have to go through the forward part. Why? Because we are not doing gradient descent, okay? Uh, we, will, we, will, we will see what form of solution we get. But what we, we are going to get is an open loop controller, okay, not a closed loop controller. There was a hand somewhere, yeah. yeah. In the previous lecture, you said uh, Hamilton equals F transpose P plus GT. Does it matter that it's P transpose? Or, yeah. Oh, no, it doesn't because uh, P is a vector and F, the output of F is also a vector. Okay. Yeah, so it's vector transpose vector. So it doesn't matter which vector comes first and which one comes second. Okay. Now, what is the gradient of H1 with respect to U1? Oh, it's going to be a messy affair. So, so it's 2R A U1, 1 minus A X1 plus A U1 plus 2R Oh, actually, there shouldn't be a u1 here. It should just be a. So 2r a multiplied by this expression, and then 2r 1 minus a x1 plus a u1 minus tf multiplied by a plus 2 u1. And this has to be equal to 0 at u1 star. Let me do this later on. So at u1 star, 
we get gradient of u1 h1 equal to 0. This is at x1 star p1, p2 star u1 star. Okay, I, you know this is a pretty long expression, but let's solve for it nonetheless, uh, just so we get some practice. I know it's kind of tedious, but it has to be done. Okay, so I need to collect all the terms involving U1 together, so I have 2RA square plus 2 r a square plus 2 u 1 plus two r a 1 minus a x 1 minus t f One minus a x one. Okay, if I'm going to make a mistake, please let me know immediately. Uh, two r a one minus a x one minus t f plus two r a one minus a x one equal to zero. This is all at at x one star and at u1 star. This implies that u1 star is equal to Oh, there has to be a negative. Can R be negative? Uh, can R be negative? No, uh, no, it has. R has to be positive. <clears throat> so we, I guess, the assumption of the maximum principle is that we basically start on the optimal path and we don't leave from the yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> so by x1 star, yes, you are, you are, you're right in saying that this x1 star indicates that you are on the optimal trajectory and you haven't deviated in the past. Is there any, any mistake with the expressions Okay, so I have P2 transpose F1, which is fine, plus U1, which is also okay. Any, uh, 
Okay, so let's. Uh, so this is the expression for u1 star in terms of x1 star. So if you haven't deviated from the trajectory, this is what u1 star is going to look like. And we can go through the same step. So what else is left? Okay, I need to find p1. Uh, so let me erase this term and I want to find p1, which is the derivative of h1 with respect to x1. Okay, so any questions so far on this? It's pretty straightforward. What I have done is I have computed p2 which is given by this expression. Uh, so if, P, if you have P2 star, which is the optimal co-state vector, then that would be X2 star here. Now I computed my Hamiltonian H1, uh, which is P2 transpose F1 plus G1, given by this long expression. And all I have to do is, so I expanded this expression with respect to X2 by substituting the expression for X2 here. And then I get this long expression. And then if I want to find u1 star along the optimal trajectory, I just need to take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to u1, set it equal to 0, which is what I have done here. Okay, So it's along the optimal trajectory. And I've set the, taken the derivative of h1 with respect to u1. I've set it equal to 0. I get u1 star as a function of x1 star along the optimal trajectory. All right. Now the next step is to find p1. So I'm going to erase this whole expression of the derivative. And now I want to compute. So my p1 is gradient of uh, h1 with respect to x1. So let's do the gradient 2r. 2r 1 minus a 1 minus a x1 plus a u1 plus 2r 1 minus a 1 minus a x1 plus a u1 minus tf plus 0. Okay, so if I want to find P1 star, if I want to find P1 star, I just need to substitute X1 star here, U1 star from there, X1 star, and then U1 star from there, and I get some very long expression of X1 star. Okay, and then I have to define my H naught. Let me do this here. H naught equals P1 transpose F naught plus G naught, and then go through the same set of expressions again. Now, of course, if you're doing it on a computer, everything is easy. Doing it by hand, it becomes a bit cumbersome. Okay, is that clear? So one of the common mistakes that you will find in papers and in many student write-ups is that they will somehow po write this as a strategy, so u1 star as a function of x1 star. Okay, but that's not the case. x1 star is a constant. It's the optimal, it's x1 at the optimal trajectory, right? And so u1 star should not be viewed as a function of x1 star x1 star is entering this expression purely as a variable. Okay? So it's wrong to say that u1 star is a function of x1 star. It's not. Okay? u1 star merely takes x1 star as input, and x1 star is just one value in the optimal trajectory. It doesn't give you the value of u1 globally. What should be the value of u1 is x1 was something else, not x1 star. 
okay and that's why this is not a closed loop control but it's done, i mean uh, if you look at many papers or many write ups written by students this is a common mistake that they use maximum principle and then they sort of come up with a closed loop control but it's not a closed loop control it's an open loop control it's an open loop control along the optimal trajectory okay is that clear is the distinction clear yes so if x1 star to x0 star has an input would it then be a closed loop control uh so so x0 is given x0 is not something that you pick so if it was if u t star took u x of t minus 1 star as an input no no it won't be you are essentially using the traject the optimal trajectory information in order to compute u1 star okay um so remember that this x1 could be anywhere on the real line okay um and this x1 star is a specific point on the real line so you're not getting u1 star if x1 were somewhere other than x1 star you see what i'm saying no <laughs> okay so, so u1 star or uh, is a function of tf and nothing else it's a function yeah you can probably view it as a function of will you be able to view it as a function of tf because tf is also entering this equation as a constant not really a variable Why? remember there is there is so the closed loop control is a function of the current state okay so u2 so u1 as a function of x1 no matter where x1 is not x1 star okay so so we're not going to use tf to update anything other than saying then what the conditions are what what the conditions absolutely have to be given a specific tf so it's not yes. an iterative function see the thing is whatever tf you pick mm -hmm. let's say you change your tf yeah. okay then it's going to affect your u not star right because you have, we haven't yet done the u not star computation mm -hmm. it's going to affect your u not star which will affect your x1 star because x1 star where do i write it so x1 star is x0 plus u0 star and u0 star is going to come from here by taking the derivative of h0 with respect to u0 and setting it equal to 0 okay okay so once you do that your u0 star will become a function of tf and that will change the value of x1 star so just changing the value of tf here is not going to get you u1 star you will also have to change the value of x1 star corresponding to this u0 star so all the star things are a function yes. of, of tf and that's the only thing they should be a function of right okay yeah now getting yeah so you have a, another question constant? sorry so you're saying x1 star is a constant yes so x1 star is a constant because uh, you get the value of u0 star from here okay and then x1 star is just x0 plus u0 star Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a good way to put it. You can't have a function of a constant. Okay. So. Okay. Any other question? Yes. So TF is a constant. It's the final temperature, desired temperature at this point. Okay. So it's a constant. It's a given parameter. Any other question? Yes. Uh, what did you mean by writing that line there that P1 star is equal to the blank? Is that like meaning it's a function of X1 star? Or yeah, it's a function of X1 star. So once you put P1 star here, then you will have X1 star here, U1 star here, which U1 star will be substituted from here. Right. So uh, solve for that? Would you solve for X1 star? No, you won't solve for X1 star. So P1 is just this long expression. So all you have to do is keep substituting the values i mean you won't substitute the value of x1 star all you will do is substitute the value of u1 star right. from here and then you will evaluate this whole expression which is going to be a pretty long expression and that will depend on x1 star right it's all okay. terms of constants yeah. in x1 star yeah in your expression for x1 star shouldn't that be 1 minus a times oh yeah of course of course 1 minus a x0 plus a u0 star and this 
u naught star is going to come from here. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Okay, is that clear? So if you had to implement a gradient descent, uh, if you have to implement gradient descent, then uh, you need to initialize u naught u1 arbitrarily, and then you need to keep, so this would be the gradient of j with respect to u naught and u1, and you will have to keep subtracting it according to some step size. So, so you will. So doing gradient descent in this case, you're solving for all of the u's at once? Yes, you will be doing solving for all of the u's at once. Okay. So that's uh, applying maximum principle, and that will give us the optimal open loop controller. Now, the goal is to compute the optimal closed loop controller, so that will take into account the state information and then based on that, take appropriate action. So let's go ahead and try to compute that optimal closed loop controller. Okay, any other questions on this? Optimal closed loop controller, which is known as policy which is gamma naught star as a function of x naught to u naught and gamma one star as a function of x one to u one. Uh, question about the optimal open loop. Yes. Well, before we move on, uh, next week when we have the exam, yes. um, is there going to be both optimal open and closed loop? Go on there, or you just want to pick one? <laughs> uh, I'm, just going, I'm just going to pick one. Okay. Uh, but you need to learn both of them. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not asking you which one. It's just an expectation for how uh, yeah. the exam's going to be. It, it's just going to be like midterm one. You have to write less and think more. Okay. Okay. Yes? Would you please explain why that is the open Loop controller. Okay, why is this an open loop control? Is, uh, just a constant, right? Yes, x1 star is just a constant. Yeah, oh, and then why is it open loop controller? Uh, because u1 star is just a number, okay? It's not a function of the current state. It's not a function of x1, okay? It's just a number. Because this is a number, this is a number. How do you get this number? Well, you get this number from here. So you, of course, need to know what u0 star is. Once you know u naught star, then this is just a number, this is just a number, these are all constant, so u1 star is just a number. You had a question. Well, somebody had a question here. It, it seems like the terminology here is a little confusing. Okay. Because, yes, I'm looking at that equation there in the wall, and I see u1 star is a function of x1 star, but what we're saying is yes. there is some magical optimal path that we, we know a priori in this Right. And we are assuming that it is exactly what it is and yes. it's never going to be. Yes. So it's an open loop control because we don't care what our actual state is. Yes. We're assuming that we're always on this level. Yes. yes. That's why it's open. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now hopefully it's not confusing terminology. Uh, now we okay. It's good. Okay. All right, so now I need to find uh, the optimal closed loop controller. So I'm just going to set my V2 of X2 as the terminal cost, which is R X2 minus TF square. Now I want to compute my gamma one star as a function of X1, that is arg min over U1 in R. my g1 plus v2, which is argmin u1 in r, r x2 minus, let me write x2 as a function of x1, so 1 minus a x1 plus a u1 minus tf square plus So the plus u1 square. So 
Sorry? Should be min instead of R min. No, this is gamma one star. Okay. Uh, so when I compute V one, then of course it will be min. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I thought that was a V in my dad. Uh, yeah, sorry, the V and gamma look similar the way I write it. Okay, so let's compute the argument. So how well we know that it's quadratic function of u1, so we just have to set the first derivative equal to zero. So let's do that. So I have r one minus a x one plus a u one minus t f multiplied by a plus two u one equal to zero. That gives me u1 let me write it as u1 star and so what I get is 2 r a u1 star a square plus 2 u1 star equal to minus 2r 1 minus a x 1 minus t f. This implies gamma 1 star x 1 is equal to minus 2r 1 minus a x1 minus tf over 2r a square plus 2. Yes. Yes. Okay, and this x1 is whatever the current state is. Plug it in here and you get what the optimal control action is going to be. Yes. Uh where? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, there should be an A here. Okay. So now I have computed gamma one star x one uh, gamma star gamma star gamma one star as a function of x one. Uh, this is a closed loop controller because no matter what x one is, this is the optimal policy. Sorry, this is once you evaluate this expression, that's the optimal control action that you need to take. Okay, uh, so this gives us a closed loop controller. Now the goal is to substitute this value here to find the min. So let me do that. So V1 of X1 is going to be the min over u1 in r g1 plus v2 uh, which basically i have to substitute this this number this value instead of u1 here and here so i'm going to get the following expression this is r 1 minus a x1 minus tf square over 1 plus r a square. It's minimizing over u1 or u0? Excuse me? It's minimizing over u1 or u0? 
U1, U1. Okay, so as you can see here, I am storing the value, the argument in the policy and I'm storing the minimum value in the value function, okay? So I need to keep track of these two, um, these two functions side by side. One is the optimal policy and the second is the value function, okay, at every point of time. Um, okay, yes? And you said that min comes from plugging in x1 and then and, uh, u1 yes. star given x1. Yes, so you, yeah, so the way you get the min value is you have u1 here and you have u1 here and you substitute this expression which is a function of x1 here and here and then you combine all the terms, cancel whatever terms needs to be canceled and you get this expression. Okay. Now we need to find gamma zero star as a function of x naught star. Okay. So what should we do? I'm going to erase this part. So my gamma zero star as a function of x naught is argmin over u naught in R. I have g naught plus v one, which is argmin over u naught in R u naught square plus v1 is right there, r over 1 plus r a square, 1 minus a, x1 minus tf square. And this x1 is equal to 1 minus a x0 plus a u0. Okay, so far so good, everything is clear. We're just following the steps of the dynamic programming. Uh, so I need to, again, this is quadratic function of u naught. I just have to take the first derivative and set it equal to zero. So two u naught star plus two r over one plus r a square. 1 minus a square x naught plus 1 minus a a u naught star minus tf and then 1 minus a multiplied by a equal to 0. Okay, is this clear? So I have to solve for u naught star and store it as in, in this gamma naught star function. So gamma naught star of x naught is going to be r <coughs> one minus a, a, tf minus 1 minus a square x naught over 1 plus r a square 1 plus 1 minus a square. Sorry, today is going to be a tedious day because we are doing examples. That's why I don't like examples. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Okay, so no matter what the value of x0 is, I get the optimal action that I need to take by plugging in the value of x0 in this particular function. Okay, so that's the closed loop controller. I can compute v0 of x0 as min of u0 in r g0 plus v1. Okay, and it will be some very big expression. We don't really have a need of that. Though. We don't need it, yeah. We don't need it for sure, but. Okay. Any questions so far? No? So as you can see, if uh, so in this particular problem, since the cost function was quadratic, we could always take the first derivative, we could compute, take all the terms involving u0 together, take all the terms involving not involving u0 on the other side, get the expression for u0 and u1. Okay, but if the cost were nonlinear, not necessarily quadratic, or if the state transition equation was nonlinear and not linear, then doing this uh, whole approach will, be, will not be possible. So we cannot do it by hand. Okay, we'll have to employ computers to do, the, do it for us to find this argmin and this min value, which means we need to store the value, the value function and the policy function, the optimal policy, either in the form of a table, okay? So if x0 is this, this is what we should do. If x0 x is this, then this is what we should do and all that. Either we have to do that or uh, one of the other ways to do it is to use what is known as function approximators, okay? Um, the idea of using function approximator is that I know that my gamma naught star is going to be nonlinear. I mean, in this case, it is linear, of course. But in the general case, it could be nonlinear, in, in which case uh, we will say that, okay, let's assume that gamma naught star is a polynomial of order n. And then we just need to fit the, based on whatever uh, optimal policy we have found, we need to fit the polynomial so that it works reasonably well in the range where the operations will be performed, okay? And that basically in increases the complexity of dynamic programming multifold, okay? Um, it's really becoming, I mean, for complicated problems, dynamic programming is just too cum cumbersome, okay? It's very difficult to get closed form expressions. You'll have to use computers, you'll have to create tables, you'll have to maybe approximate or uh, do some sort of regression to approximate a function uh, and so on. And you have to do not only for the policy, but you also have to do for the value function. And then once you propagate the value function backwards, you introduce errors in your computation at every point of time. So it's just something that you have to do. Uh, so what's the way out? So very recently, People have figured out that neural networks are good function approximators, so they are using neural networks to approximate policy, and they are using neural networks to approximate the value function. And the result of that is that it turns out that neural networks are really very good function approximators. Um, I mean, we know theoretically why, but we don't uh, quite know how the structure works. Uh, but it's, it, it has allowed people to play games like chess and AlphaGo Zero, sorry, AlphaGo, no, the game of Go, AlphaGo is the name of the algorithm. So the game of Go and some of these very nice robotic uh, 
manipulation task, people have been able to do that now because they recognize that neural networks can be used as function approximators here and here, and they turn out to do a very good job. Okay? And this field is um, known as deep learning, right? So you might have read some news about deep learning can do this, deep learning can do that. And the reason why deep learning can do this and that is because they just happen to be very good function approximators for tasks like these. Okay? All right. The other thing that I want to note is the issue of time consistency, which uh, we haven't talked about, but there is an example. So there is a problem in your assignment that talks about time consistency. So, so I want to introduce the notion of time consistency, but I won't go too deeply into it. So you have weekly, time consistent uh, policy which implies or which is defined as if you or if the system is on optimal trajectory if the system is at the optimal trajectory then at time t, ut star all the way up to ut minus 1 star still remains optimal. Remains optimal for time s greater than or equal to t. Sorry? You have the range from T to capital T minus 1, or is it from S and more? The, so, so we are looking at the problem moving. So I'm looking, so I'm standing at time T. I know that I've been on optimal trajectory so far. And I'm looking at the future actions that I need to take. Okay. And it turns out that whatever you computed using the maximum principle, whatever the open loop trajectory you have computed, remains optimal for all the time periods henceforth. Okay. And then you have strongly time consistent. You don't have to write it because these are concepts that are not part of this course, but it's important to know it. Uh, strongly time consistent policy, which basically says no matter what happened in the past, no matter what happened in the past, gamma t star all the way up to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal for time t grid, so for time s greater than or equal to t. Okay? So, what's the notion of this time consistency? Well, I am. Uh, so what's the reason of studying time consistency? I have a control system, okay? Uh, I use one of these methods to solve my problem, compute the optimal actions that I need to take over the, uh, over a decision horizon of length t. The question is that now that I have acted in the past and I'm standing at time t, I have, I have a state xt, what I have computed earlier still remains the optimal traject still remains the optimal solution or not for the rest of the decision problem. Okay? That's an important so that's an important aspect of a dynamic optimization problem because so what's the reason? You have acted in the past, you might have some new information, and the question is because now that you have new information, should you revise your optimal solution or not? Okay? Should you revise the optimal solution or not? So I have three minutes, so I'll give you an example. Uh, and this is, the, this is the reason why I've given you this, uh, this assignment, 
problem four in the assignment. Let's say my policy is I have a cake in front of me and my policy is I want to eat this cake now and then tomorrow morning I'm going to hit the gym, I'm going to do two hour long workout. Okay, so that's my policy. I'm going to eat the cake now and I'll do the gym for two hours tomorrow. So I eat the cake now because I executed my policy and then I wake up tomorrow morning, oh, I'm tired, this and that, I have to go do optimization homework or whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's, let's skip the gym today, okay? So what has happened? New information has come, I mean whatever, I don't know what will change between today and tomorrow, but anyway, some new information arrived. You wake up in the morning and you try to look for an optimal solution from that time onwards, and it turns out going to the gym is not an optimal policy at that time, okay? Doing the optimization homework turned out to be the optimal policy, which is also a good policy. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in this case, what has happened is you solved the optimization problem at time zero, okay, and then time one arrived, and it turns out that what you solved at the time zero doesn't seem to be optimal at this point of time, okay? And this is an issue of human behavior, human decision making. It's not an issue of machine decision making. Machines always remain time consistent, but humans are not time consistent. They don't make time consistent decisions, and that's what that example tries to uh, tries to um, exemplify, okay? So you will, you will solve the problem and you will see that the human decision maker doesn't have a time consistent policy. So what's an example of something that is weakly time consistent but not strongly time consistent? So whatever result you get from maximum principle is weakly time consistent. So let's say there is a, something happened in the furnace, okay? Some fault happened in the furnace and your U0 was not really U0 star, it was something else. Then you have to redo the entire computation for the rest of the time because now the, you're not on the optimal trajectory anymore, okay, because of the fault. But if you use dynamic programming to come up with the optimal policy, no matter what happened at furnace one, you still have an optimal policy for furnace two. Okay, so it's the guarantees for the open loop controller versus the closed yes, loop controller. Yes, yes. Okay. So open loop controller would be time consistent, closed loop controller would be strongly time consistent if you have used dynamic programming to come up with the optimal policy. And human decision making is not time consistent for whatever reason it's given in the example, uh, sorry, in the assignment. So please go and take a look at it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. Have a good Thanksgiving break.